I am happy um, to uh, introduce and welcome Dr. Ahmed Al Niyami this morning. Um, Dr. Al Niyami received his bachelor's in medicine and surgery from the University of Al Naran in Iraq. He then did residencies in both general surgery and obstetrics and gynecology um, before fellowship in Juan Oncology here at UW. Um, he is now an associate professor of gynecologic oncology um, here in the department. He is also currently the head of the surgical quality outcomes for the Department of OBGYN and the chair of the QIRC committee. Um, he, his passion is implementing innovative surgical techniques to improve surgical outcomes. Um, and he is also the creator and manager of multiple large data, uh, data programs to track clinical outcomes metrics in GYN oncology and obstetrics. His research interests include optimization of health and surgical outcomes. Um, please join me in giving a virtual welcome to Dr. Al Niyami this morning. Thank you so much again uh, to the Grand Rounds Committee and inviting me to talk. And I just want to make sure that my voice is heard and my presentation is uh, is shown. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. All good. <clears throat> Thank That's you. Great. So today we'll talk about the quality outcomes uh, as it was in the past. Uh, where are we going here? And ultimately, uh, where are we heading in the future? I do not have any financial uh, uh, interest or conflict of interest. The objectives today is to uh, really understand the uh, metrics that we do uh, after surgery, whether it's mortality or morbidity. We will also talk about the QI project that has been done ongoing and will be performed in the near future uh, that talks about uh, quality metrics and how to improve this, uh, this thing. We will uh, ultimately uh, and start to talk about the, the mortality as the first part of this talk. In a way, mortality is a, in a, in a simplified way, it's, it's really easy. Um, it's you're either dead or not. Um, but really, as we will see in the next uh, few minutes, you know, things are very complex. Uh, historically, hospitals are uh, places where usually uh, people die. So the mortality rates historically or the hospitals are very much associated with uh, death. But now the mortality is frequently measured the outcome, uh, not only for uh, individual hospitals, uh, surgeons and providers, but the whole care system. Um, in a way, uh, mortality is simple, it's dichotomized, whether they're either dead or not. Um, it's critically relevant and important, and there is um, basically no uh, inner observer variability um, in the death matter. However, there is a little bit of ambiguity in collecting and looking at data. Um, is this mortality post-discharge um, or not, or is it in the hospital? Um, data accuracy always comes into question. Um, the time frame of the death, whether it's the first uh, four weeks, uh, three months, or up to a year, depending on the surgery rendered, and depend on uh, the interventions are that are given. And the biggest confounder is the usually the patient's uh, uh, confounding uh, factors of uh, morbidity, which and plus the age, which we all die in a way uh, at the end. So it's just a matter of when do we intervene and if the intervention actually caused the death. If we look at those ambiguity, uh, we start dissecting after that the expected mortality vary. Uh, you know, we look at it and it varies, but whether it's this uh, surgery is electable or emergency, uh, we can't hold any surgeon accountable for uh, high mortality when they are dealing with um, emergency and trauma. Uh, while well, we have to examine the mortality if a procedure is a simple uh, removal of mole or fixing a hernia, for example. And that, for that matter, the surgeries that can vary from a simple hernia repair to a ruptured AAA where uh, the mortality is between 50 to 70 percent. And of course, the morbidities are always there. So let's talk about the mortality over the decades, uh, and we will understand through there the, the evolution of the mortality and what we learned and how we can go from here. Um, the big study that has been done uh, by Dr. Jeffrey, uh, 350,000 uh, patients who have gone under uh, surgery uh, from the 70s down to the 2000s uh, found that actually the mortality has been dropping over the decades. It's between 5.1 in the 70s 
and down to really the 3.6 on average. And of course, it varies from 0.1 to up to 50% in the case of the high risk uh, surgeries. But I think what's, uh, what's important from that study and the conclusion is that actually this mortality uh, is lower even with the patients being older, uh, we have more comorbidities and we actually have high surgery uh, volume of surgery that we're performing. So the conclusion from the group that looks at mortality at the international level uh, concluded that actually the, probably the reason or one of the reasons for this improvement of mortality is not only the high volume, which we will talk extensively about, but uh, actually better knowledge uh, by surgeons and by hospitals and practitioners on how to care for patients and how to address diseases. And uh, probably a better technology, although that's a leap of faith, uh, because uh, really argumentally and philosophically, the only, the only two things that happened in surgery is the electrocautery and the minimal invasive surgeries. And the electrocautery, there is no uh, doubt that it does uh, impact survival and uh, improve the surgical outcome, but the technology has a little bit of a question on it. And we will talk about that in a second. So the three uh, main explanations for mortality, as we talked about, um, the the big study that was published by Walsh uh, actually examined the technology impact on mortality, and uh, they looked at 750,000 patients who have gone through surgeries in the last 30 years, and the the technology have probably put in question in terms of mortality. However, they did address that MIS did improve morbidity and quality outcomes, but not the mortality. So just to uh, lay out that. So if we uh, put the technology aside and uh, put it as a question mark, the really the, the biggest problem that we have is the volume and the knowledge. And those are the things that actually uh, did matter in terms of mortality as we will really dig deeper into those two factors. There's no doubt that high volume surgeons and high volume hospitals uh, lower mortality uh, but uh, it's a statement that can be easily uh, uh, gained, but a little bit deceptive because um, you can ask the question, what is it in the high volume hospitals and doctors that actually makes a difference? Uh, is it their technique? Is it the, the hospital? Um, is it the care that's rendered after? Uh, is it detection and so on and so forth? And we'll go uh, into, a detect into digging that. And actually, uh, Dr. Jeffrey actually uh, did also study uh, whether it's the hospital volume or the surgeon hospital volume, and then he will, uh, we will show with you, uh, share with you some of the literature that he found um, uh, interesting. And the biggest uh, interest uh, now is, uh, or the largest problem, whether we are metrically measuring things correctly, because the denominator is changing as, as time goes by. So for example, um, the, uh, this is the big study that looked at volume and mortality, and in every metric that, uh, uh, whether it's cancer or cabbage or aneurysm, the bigger the volume of the of the hospital and the bigger the volume that are uh, the surgery that are done, uh, the better the mortality or the lower the mortality. So that's a fact that has been replicated over and over again. Um, the question uh, whether uh, it is actually um, what is it in the volume. Uh, that uh, lowers mortality and the biggest confounding factors, and we will see that as a theme, is actually morbidity. So when we look at hospital volumes and surgeons, we found that the higher the volume, so here's the, um, the lower part is the hospital volume and the upper is actually uh, the diseases or the complications. And it, some, some complications do matter or do mature more. For example, myocardial infarction, heart failures and pneumonias do better later as the volume really gets bigger. Uh, and so the renal failure and the pneumonias are, you know, a little bit matures a little faster. So it is uh, about the volume. Uh, however, the counter argument uh, in that uh, and the counter argument about the hospital volume per se is that uh, a study published by O'Connell uh, looked at the hospital volume and the complications and they found that actually uh, truly, the mortality doesn't change with the hospital volume. It's actually the morbidity, and they argued that actually only the readmission has been lowered uh, when you do more of the same surgery. And this is just to put a dent on the fact that hospital volume uh, do matter. However, we will go into details, uh, or the question is whether hospital volume or surgeon volume has been um, 
uh, is the is the problem or is the solution um, in Japan? A big study looked at the surgeon's volume versus uh, hospital volume. So the one on the right of the screen um, is the uh, hospital volume, and the one on the left is surgeon's volume. And around 17 or 20 pa patients per year, where surgeon starts to drop their mortality. But the hospital, it takes them around 130 cases of that specific surgery where the mortality starts to drop. So there is a little bit of discrepancy between the surgeon's maturity by themselves and the hospital maturity by their, by their uh, procedure numbers. And that actually uh, made the hospital ask questions, why do we actually lag behind, uh, in, behind each individual surgeon and the solution will come in in a few minutes. The other question that was proposed is that are we actually uh, having a problem with the denominator? And and this is probably true. Uh, the largest study showed that the mortality after cancer surgery is lowered with decades. However, the big study by Dr. Khoury actually examined all the cancers and they found that it's not true for uniformly you know, for all cancers. And compared to the 90s and 2000s, only rectal cancers and colon cancer actually got better in terms of mortality, but none of the other cancers. So the proposed solution or proposed thought is that actually some cancers have been uh, actually have been, de been detected early. So if we imagine that rectal cancer in the 90s are presented in an advanced stage um, in the 2000s with the Density of colonoscopies, patients are being detected in early stages, so that actually the more the surgeries are easier and the mortality is better. And this has not been replicated in ovarian and uterine cancer. So uh, pro I propose the NCDB data, and we hopefully will get the data next week. Hopefully, we'll make it for SGO. We will look into the mortality uh, as a whole. Uh, we probably have uh, half a million uh, data points uh, in that, and we will look into the mortality per decades and per stages, and as it matures with time, whether actually time, uh, whether with time we actually having less or earlier stages and hence less mortality, and if mortality is actually similar in higher stage, more complex surgeries. So in terms of the knowledge, uh, the maturity of knowledge of surgeons and hospitals, uh, a study have been, lo have been looking at, uh, at that as a determinant. And they wait, they found actually it's very interesting. They found that actually mortality is purely linked to postoperative complication and morbidity. And I think that study, which was published in 2005 by the Curie Group, actually have turned around and made hospitals and all of us focus on the mortality not being an inert, out of the blue. Uh, problem, but it's actually a matter of complication from surgery. So if complication or morbidity actually um, decreases or increases the mortality, then does it matter then if we have to uh, address the morbidity? And that's where the link to the morbidity, and we'll talk a little bit more about the other metric that we use, which is called the failure to rescue. So in a second, in just a couple of slides, we just want to have to see that all patients, when they have complications, their mortality drops. Uh, definitely, this is true for pulmonary complication and wound complication. It's so true, so much true for pulmonary complication, actually more than wound complication. And this is, has been replicated not only in abdominal surgeries, but in cardiovascular surgery, where uh, just a single leak of, the, of troponin after surgery is actually linked with higher mortality, even if the surgery and all the other complications uh, did not exist. So there is a link between the mortality um, and the uh, morbidity. Actually, the link was so strong, and this has been replicated. This is just another study for SSI. This has been linked so much that another study by the uh, by Dr. Schieser, um, who have published on this extensively, and look at all cancer surgeries for the last 20 years, and they, what they found is actually the biggest confounding factors for uh, mortality is the margins involved in all the cancers, and of course, you know, with the grain of salt margins are, you know, uh, varies between cancers and cancers, but the complication, which is actually equal in the hazard ratio, but actually more significantly uh, impactful on the complication, and none of the thing, other things actually mattered, whether it's lymph node uh, extensive surgery or female or age, or, or even they looked at the errors between 2001 and after, 
they found that actually the biggest confounder is not only the perfection of the surgery, which is the margin, which can improve theoretically as the surgeon improves, but actually the complication. So in that sense, if this is um, if this is the uh, this is the Kaplan Meyer, then what do we do for complication to prevent mortality? And here's the new uh, here's the new metric, which is called the failure to rescue. So in 2011, uh, a metric, a new metric came uh, to existence called the failure to rescue. The failure to rescue is a metric that looked at hospital and if they failed to rescue a complication, and because that is linked to mortality. Well, the question is, do you really do you really have another metric, and does it really work? And it does. Um, so uh, this uh, same uh, same study by again the Jaffrey uh, group, they looked at mortality in high failure to rescue, that is low rescue. It's a little bit twist on English language, or low failure to rescue, that is high rescue. And they looked at all complication, whether it's medical or surgical, and I have selected just few just for us to understand it. And here we are in low rescue, that is high failure to rescue, the mortality can be up to 30% and significantly drops when there is high rescue and the odd ratio is three. And this is very true for medical complications of surgery, surgical complications, including surgical side effects. So it became very clear that actually the link to mortality is morbidity and the link to fixing morbidity is not to purely only lower it down, but truly to uh, to rescue it or to uh, address that uh, complication. So in a big way, better resource, uh, better rescue, better morbidity, correcting morbidity, to correct morbidity, less mortality. So large hospital can actually have been shown to be a better rescuers for morbidity and sense it lowers mortality, and this is again by the same group. They looked at mortality and complications and failure to rescue. So if we look at the complication, they actually did not drop significantly the more volume they have in the hospital. What happened is that the higher the volume of the hospital, the lower the mortality because there is a high rescue or lower rescue um, uh, lower failure to rescue. So that is where now we understand that actually hospital volumes is actually linked to the rescuing of complication and rather just merely addressing or preventing complications. Um, it, and this is a very big and important thing because now we don't have to reprimand hospitals and surgeons on the existence of complications, but we have to look into hospitals if they actually fail to address the complication itself. And this is also true uh, in terms of uh, hospital volume. So the question is, what is a hospital volume? Is it physicians or nurses per, uh, per ratio? And this is true is actually, they looked at high uh, volume hospitals and they found that the highest hospital volume that has the lowest mortality because it has the highest uh, failure, uh, the lowest failure to rescue, actually the one that has more physicians to bed ratio and more nurses to bed ratio. So it comes full circle that actually mortality and hospital and mortality is a volume and knowledge. And it's actually the volume is actually not the hospital and the bed itself, but the people who work in the hospital and their commitment to provide a better care for morbidity and ultimately mortality. So in a summary, the mortality improves with time, but actually the high volume, which is actually physicians and nurses who actually have rescue morbidity ultimately change the mortality phase and hopefully will continue on. So speaking of, since morbidity is the most important thing, the next subject is morbidity. Now morbidity is a little bit hard and that's probably the bulk of my, uh, of my talk is about morbidity and how can we understand it and how can we classify it, define it and how, what do we do for it? And also some of the failures and successes at uh, both national level and at the university where we did. It's frustrating because, uh, you know, uh, what are comor uh, what are the morbidities or the complications? How we classify them? Who keeps track of them? Um, how can we predict them? Do we really can modify them? Do we rescue them? There is heterogeneity of classification. Um, whether complication is a time early versus late, uh, whether it's location lo local or distal, uh, whether causation, whether it's surgical complication or non-surgical complication. And patient comes in, surgery and surgery went well, but the patient had a heart attack and died. Well, is it surgical? Is it medical complications? And those, all those heterogeneities keep playing 
and preventing us from actually accurately quantifying the morbidities and have a better understanding what they are. So without even that, not even not even the definition of complication, but the depth of complication is also heterogeneous. Whether fever by itself is a complication, whether we have an infection or not. Now, what kind of uh, definition do we do? Do we do CDC uh, definition or do we actually isolate organism? And for example, the depth of respiratory distress, is it something that we uh, prevented and corrected with only oxygen nasal cannula or we actually had to intubate the patient? Those are two respiratory distresses, but the grade and the level of those complications is an ambiguous to say the least. That's the example. So in that sense, what we do is um, is what adds to the complication is whom do we uh, report? Do we go the hospital metrics or do we do CM, uh, CMS, the, uh, the Center for Medical Medicare and Medicaid Services? So we will break them down to the metrics that we actually matters to the hospital and so many metrics that are CMS uh, labeled and uh, those are SSI and death and now we're just going to look into those. Uh, separately, so let's talk about the traditional uh, morbidities that most commonly tracked. Every hospital looks at your uh, or our surgical site infection, readmission, reoperation, and some of the medical morbidities. And the less commonly tracked is the left hospital stay and blood utilization. I've picked those out of plethora and many of all the morbidities just to talk about them and see what we have done and what can we do to even improve. So. Um, you know, the hospital, the UW, there is no uh, doubt that uh, 2011 and 12, the, um, the standard uh, infection rate of the hospital was three uh, times higher than the nation. So uh, an assemble wa a team was assembled. Of course, the team was looked at the fishbone, whether it's, you know, going patient, going surgery to end up with a surgical side infection. And there are, of course, so many, so many factors. Now, the bigger the fishbone, as we as we studied fishbones and how a QI project uh, happens, the bigger the fishbone, the higher the stakes, and the bigger the team will be. And so, UW committed to address this issue and uh, assembled a team of uh, 37 people. It was uh, just a great team to to look into this. What we have started with is the standardized infection rate ratio, which is around the three in 2000 in in, in that time. And we, through many years, started to drop it until the point where we actually officially in 2018 dropped below the standard down to zero. And of course, at the Corona age, um, at the Corona year, we had two infections that, um, you know, had some some mistakes in it. So we bumped up and then we dropped down. And so far, in two and a half years, we have consistently stayed below below the uh, below the average. Now, you know. Of course, this is a bundle, so there is no single measure. So, but how bundles works is actually many steps. Each step lowers the infection rate or lowers their target a little bit, and conglomeration of all those bundles ultimately lead to a success. What we have done is is not only implemented the uh, the the bundles, but actually what we did is uh, measured every surgeon and hence all the all the group. Uh, their adoption and their compliance over time. And without boring you through all the laborious uh, work that we have done, uh, for every uh, metric, we actually uh, collected prospectively the data. We looked at, for example, bowel prep, and we are in 94, 95%. We looked at abdominal prep by nurses. We are like, really improving with time. Uh, this is also perennial prep, um, sequestering. Uh, Instruments before closure, there's we can improve on that, we can get better. But cool-off changes are improving, and all the other metrics are improving. And the reason we assuming, uh, we're, we're showing you that because ultimately Andrea O'Shea, one of our fellows, took it on herself, and she said, "Let's let's look into this." Um, so for the last uh, seven years, Andrea Lok uh, O'Shea O'Shea is one of our fellows who is now in Minnesota. She looked at the bundle compliance, and she looked at infections. So we had a lot of infections and it keeps going up and down, up and down until in 2015, which was the highest, and we dropped it down. And she said, you know, let's look at bundle compliance, which was genius idea. She presented that to the SGO. What we found is that bundle compliance, which is in red, is synchronized with the infection in a way 
with a logarithmic way, she found that, for example, when the compliance goes up, the infection follows suits in two or three quarters after. If the compliance goes down, the infection goes up, and so and so forth. Go up, go down, go up, go down. And so what we found, and she presented this, she, she found that actually compliance above 75 and ideally above 95 with, with minimal fluctuation, with minimizing standard deviation, actually improves surgical side infection. And that's what the ultimate streak in having us uh, lowering the infection rate is the absolute uh, b b compliance bundle. So that is the success with the surgical side infection. Uh, now, the other metric is readmission, and I just have to be conscious of the time. Now, the other metric is readmissions. Readmissions are always heinous. Uh, we always hear about our readmission rate and that readmission rate and so on and so forth. And there is no uh, doubt that readmission is important for hospitals because it's, a, as the economists say, it's a sunk money. Uh, you can retrieve the money that you spent on readmissions because you've already retrieved, uh, you've already got paid for whatever surgery you have uh, rendered. So readmission is a metric. Uh, hospital readmission varies uh, depending on the surgery. Uh, the question is, uh, actually, um, Shtanshu published a readmission uh, studies and looked at the higher the volume, the higher the surgical complexity, the higher your admission is. And uh, Dandy, our uh, residence who's now fellow at uh, UC Irvine, actually took it further and she said, actually, not only that, but she's going to look at readmission, whether it actually matters to patients. So it's not only that Shtanshu shows that uh, our um, our readmission is higher by default of surgical complication, but then they took it and she said whether actually readmission actually matters on the long run. So she looked at uh, 10 years worth of data for UW. She looked at the total readmission in ER physician for the total period of uh, primary treatment, whether it's primary cycle reduction followed by six cycles of chemotherapy or the new adjuvant therapy group where they got chemotherapy, surgery, and chemotherapy. So she looked at all the six to seven months period of time. She counted all those readmissions. And we found interesting, of course, uh, findings that we all the readmissions and ER visits are 41% and similar and consistent to what the group in Michigan, Dr. Shitan Shupal, have, uh, have published. Uh, but what we found in a multivariate analysis that actually those readmission does not matter on survival, and what matters is actually uh, primary site. Uh, what matters is optimal site reduction. So that was published and 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 done, and then uh, becomes uh, hopefully uh, will hopefully change the way we look at readmissions. Uh, of course, readmission. Uh, I'm not naive. Readmission will always be uh, a marker for uh, for morbidity. But I think. One of her conclusions that she published is that we might have to think about uh, readmission as a metric that as a punitive metric uh, rather than as a, just a financial metric. Now, reoperation after surgery is is robust and it's important. Uh, pancreas surgeries uh, published data uh, showed that up to 11% of reoperations within 60 uh, days of surgery is a real thing. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, reoperation lead to longer hospital stay and ICU admission, and mortality is higher. But even when we take that mortality into into perspective, and if even when we include those patients who died because they are got reoperated, actually there is no impact on survival on long term uh, with those patients who got operated and not operated on. And of course, this has been replicated in ovarian cancer. Uh, the German group, Dr. Dubois, looked at uh, his reoperation in 60 days, and um, they found that it's 22% reoperation. It's a little bit higher because you know we know the Dubois groups are a little bit more uh, aggressive surgically, uh, have um, have you know more debulkings and, and a little bit more aggressive surgery, and they found that actually readmission is 20, reoperation is 22%, and that leads, of course, to longer hospitals. And they also found that there is really no impact on survival, which is reassuring to not only the hospital and the, the physicians that although they might have an aggressive surgeons, they might have readmission, they might reoperate on, on a lot of people, really on the long term as an oncology service, actually um, we don't impact it 
uh, and that is a multivariate analysis. So took it upon ourselves uh, and coming on for the SGO 2022 in uh, Phoenix, uh, we retrieved the data in uh, 1400 patients uh, at UW, all, uh, all surgeries, and we are looking into the reoperation. Very interesting data is coming from the statistician and hopefully we'll keep you posted because we cannot uh, disclose um, uh, the findings, but the findings is very interesting. Now, uh, in terms of reoperation, if we rest that, we will look into blood utilization, which again is a financial incentive uh, and also survival incentive. So one of the studies have, have looked at blood transfusion, whether it actually lowers immunity and actually uh, impact on survival. And there is a lot of debate back and forth between specialties and cancer specialties and hospitals, whether that is true. Um, so what, what we did, we looked at our utilization at UW over the last 10 years uh, in OGU oncologies. We had 1,041 patients. We had a 23.7% transfusion rate. Of course, this is over 10 years and we have improvised a restrictive blood transfusion. So this is all comers. Um, I wanted to remind ourselves by, you know, addressing uh, our uh, residents and fellows who have published on this and uh, Kevin McCool with Dr. Berlet have looked into new adjuvant chemotherapies. Uh, they looked at 66 patients and they studied the impact of blood transfusion on survival. And they found that there is actually no impact of blood transfusion on survival. What we will be uh, doing, and this is again coming on SGO 2021, we had all those uh, more than 1,000 patients. We looked at all their factors, and what we found this is just a preview of what the SGO will see is that there is actually no impact on survival. This is a large database, uh, and more, of course, details to be submitted. We, uh, we did the multivariate analysis, and very interesting data is coming out, so I'm, I'm excited. But of course, with the blood transfusion, we have uh, we have taken a restrictive uh, measures in 2017 uh, with the blood bank. Uh, Dr. Uh, Connor, uh, who was who is now the blood bank, uh, the head of the blood bank, actually looked into a restrictive blood transfusion protocol, and we implemented that. Uh, the question whether that is um, is actually restricting blood actually impact uh, complication. Uh, and save money. And uh, Rachel, our uh, our one of our residents, looking into this, and uh, she finalized the abstract. I I saw that yesterday, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll bring it to SGO 2022, looking at the restrictive uh, blood transfusion data, and whether it actually how it does not impact uh, uh, surgical outcomes and medical uh, complication. Very interesting data, and and uh, very proud of uh, everybody who's working on this. Now, the question is, you know, after all this complications and back and forth, whether actually this complication, you know, matters in terms of, uh, of the things that we do. The question is, well, how do you bundle all those complications? How do you look at actual outcomes? And again, uh, when we ask that question in our, in our, um, with one of our uh, residents, uh, Ross uh, Harrison, who is MD Anderson fellow right now, uh, took it on himself. He looked into the impact of a bundled uh, postoperative complication and whether it actually is linked to delaying chemotherapy. We know that Dr. Uh, Tibari actually have published a study from UC Irvine looking at uh, the delay of chemotherapy, whether there is a time after which there is a, a bad prognosis or bad uh, high recurrence, and Ross confirmed that. He looked at uh, all our data. Uh, and he presented that also at the SGO. He looked and we concluded that after 28 days, there is higher recurrence rate and that's, you know, p-value and that's how we funneled it that, bundled, uh, bundled all the post-operative complication. But, you know, in a way, we ask ourselves whether delay of chemotherapy is actually equates to progression-free survival because the question is, well, you caused harm, you corrected it, you delayed chemotherapy, does it really matter on progression-free survival? And one of our students uh, took that on her. Uh, she also presented that uh, at the SGO of last year, and she looked into ovarian cancer, advanced ovarian cancer, 491 patients. And uh, she bundled all the complications. We'll talk about bundling complications and how to better classify complications. 
and uh, looked at all the bundle complications of grade three and four on Kel, Pravi, and Bendu classification, and she found it to be 5%. And she did not, uh, she did find that actually having a complication does impact survival, progression free survival. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Wong, Connor Wong, our residents is uh, taking this study and hopefully putting it in publication, hopefully very soon before he starts interviewing uh, for joint ecology this year or the year after. So, so now we have had, uh, you know, studies that actually looked at the impact of uh, morbidity on, on progression free uh, and overall, and the question for us is whether actually we are truly measuring um, more, uh, the mortality and morbidity. Are we counting for the confounding factors of the patients? And that's where was brought up with Dr. Farhoff, our, uh, our uh, quality outcome, UW. And what we did is went back uh, 2015 and looked at improving the observed over expected mortality and morbidity. We also published that at the SGO. And, you know, I'm, I'm writing this with Dr. Hartenbach to be uh, hopefully submitted very soon. It's a, basically a QI project where we actually went back and accurately reclassified and accurately coded for comorbidities. Um, and we looked at the uh, baseline comorbidities. And what we found is that when we correctly um, look into that, the denominator starts to change. We're not changing the denominator, but we are understanding how risky our patients are. It's a very complex uh, CMS uh, rules. But what we ended up finding is that after the start of the QI projects, without even impacting uh, a lot of complications, although some complications got dropped with time, uh, what we found is that actually we dropped the standard rate ratio from one that is above average to below one in morbidity, and we dropped the mortality also, although it is lower than one anyway, but statistically it was significant, although not very clinically impactful, but the morbidity metrically was dropped by just correcting the way we actually code for the complication and how complicated patients coming into surgery before even surgery. So that is one of the you know ideal things to also do is to correctly code and correctly understand. Now, um, the system of classification, post-operative complication, and that's one of the uh, one of the sticking points here. Uh, traditionally, we just count how many complications uh, that uh, that happen to the patients, um, and it's redundant. It's old, and until 1992, where the uh, Toronto 92 uh, classification came to existence, Dr. Clavin Dindu, uh, Clavin and Dindu reclassified the uh, complication, and we will talk a little bit more about that. But basically, what they took is that every single complication, they would grade it from one to five, um, and then, so for example, if you have a, an infection, uh, then the grade is one, two, three, four, five, where five is death, and one is uh, a minimal intervention. And then, and then that was published. We, all the studies that we have mentioned above in the presentation, and all the residents and the fellows that looked into it, they actually include the Clavian Dendu classification, which we will talk about just in, in the next slide. So the Clavian Dindu classification came in 2004. It basically grades every single complication from one to five, where five is death, that's the ultimate complication. And one is really just any deviation that normal postoperative course, for example, pain is grade one, uh, nausea is a grade one. But once you start intervening for that, uh, for that complication, it becomes grade two. So if you if you give um, extra medication for nausea, it becomes grade two. But if you intervene, uh, draining an abscess, opening, reoperating, then it becomes grade three. And grade four is life threatening, meaning go to the ICU. And there's specific uh, definition on life threatening complication. And of course, if you die, then you become grade five. So what we did. Um, what we did in synchrony to what other specialties have done, there's a lot of specialties done, urology, ortho, they all published on the on the kappa value of that new classification compared to the traditional. And they found that that's not only impactful, but actually meaningful. 
you know, I always rem remind myself that Clavian and Dandu classification is similar to the old uh, staging system. You know, before the FIGO staging, they were just description of, of uh, stages of cancer, and then FIGO came in and classified the, the cancers into stage one, two, three, and four, and reinforced it, and of course, it changed it a little bit, but became a standard of care that every cancer has to be staged, and this is the staging booklet. So I think Clavian and Dandu, and uh, later, which is now adopted by the cancer institution, they called it the CTCA, the Common Terminology uh, Criteria for Adverse Events. It's basically a book, and it's on version five. It's basically a book, uh, 170 uh, pages book, uh, that talks about every single complication and then grade them one to five. So the premise, and hopefully at the UW quality level, what we are doing is uh, re, uh, rewriting that dictionary of complication. We call it the U UW COCAS, the post-operative complication assessment system. It's a system wide, uh, wide based. It depends, it's actually based on Clavian Dendu with CTCAE. And what we will do starting hopefully soon, of course, COVID delayed everything, is to start centralizing the complication classification, having people actually look at this complication and grade them for us. Um, and that will be included in the EMR system. Uh, then we will go retrospectively and look at the kappa value of the GYN and co complications to the previous uh, traditional ones. Uh, we will, uh, the next step, we will verify it with general surgery and Dr. Uh, Scarborough is, is into this. Uh, he's the head of the quality for the general surgery. And of course, we will go back and validate with the other old system, which is Nesquip, to reassure ourselves that this new system is actually works. And hopefully the ultimate truth is, you know, four or five years down the road, we might have to start uh, having a predictive model. The predictive model of post-operative complication allows us to use, utilize this classification, which is an accurate classification, and, and use it to predict the complication to have a high, um, uh, a low failure to rescue uh, uh, teams. So the ultimate truth is that once we predict it better, we will assemble the team to rescue it better. And then if we assemble the team to rescue it better, we decrease the morbidity outcome, which is the mortality. And hopefully by doing so, um, it, it helps uh, the, uh, the system in general to get into the point where we are addressing those morbidities and mortality. So that's how 360 degrees uh, it comes to uh, to a circle. So of course the predictive model, depending on the um, the uh, the um, classification how of how the scoring system is, and there are many. All of us are aware of the ASA and Charleston eight, but the POSM is the new one. Uh, it includes uh, operative variability, so that's where we are trying to uh, incorporate that and look into the POSM and link it to the CTCAE and then see if we can ultimately uh, create a formula where prediction is better and intervention, early intervention, and very low failure to rescue uh, will ultimately come to existence. So that is how we will hopefully link everything. In the last uh, minute or two, we will talk about the future metrics, uh, feared or dreaded or hopeful as the patient's reported outcome. Uh, so many studies have looked into patients reported outcome and, and what matters actually to patients. Uh, what matters to hospitals minimize readmissions and you know prevent the spread of the, or the expenditure. What matters to surgeon is that we don't want to harm patients, but we don't want to impact their oncology outcome. And actually, uh, Heather Einstein actually was a pioneer in this. She actually did a study when she was um, a fellow with me. Uh, she's she was my co-fellow. And she looked into what matters to patients when it comes to uh, cervix cancer treatment, whether it's radiation or radical hysterectomy. And she did that with Dr. Hartenbach. And what they found that actually patients' perspective of complications and wants and not wants is actually diff vastly different from what we perceive and what the institution or what the SGO or the FIGO wants us to, uh, to label things. So it's a little bit composite. It's hard because it's patient-specific. Um, what what matters uh, ultimately is is um, what patients want, but the the caution or the disadvantages of the pros are little known about you know pros in clinical practice. They are used in clinical trials, 
um, it's the difficulty of selecting a PROM, which is the uh, patient's related outcome metrics uh, for each surgery, for each patient, uh, then for each society, uh, whether we are all similar, but our perspectives are different and that difference changes with time. So what the POM today or what the pros today might not be the pros in the future. And so it's a very uh, complex subject. And I know Dr. Samuel Wallace is involved with the SGO with the patients re uh, related outcomes. And uh, it's, it's short of uh, saying that's a, it's a immense mountain to climb, but uh, I'm sure ultimately what will happen is that patients will ultimately the hope is to have them dictate what they want and what they don't want as we all like that to be uh, to be literally measured. So, you know, um, there's a new future thing is the functional assessment cancer therapy scale, and that's even more complicated. It actually uh, looked into uh, this is a study that looked not only on patients um, input, but physicians input, and they graded it and then mathematically come up with a number for each complication. Um, and that is ultimately the future, but we're not there yet. But I wanted to say and remind everybody that when complications happen, um, I know that there are uh, patients, uh, patients as a victim, and we talked about secondary victims, which is the providers. But I, short of saying complications and mortality not only involve the first uh, victim, which is the patient, but providers are second victims. But really, the third victims are the family, fourth victim is the hospital or, or the institute that you work in. Society is a victim of complications. Um, I always say when when a surgeon has a complication, society also is affected because that surgeon will for a few months or maybe six months will be gun shy or <laughs> as they say. So, uh, and you know, I'm guilty of that too. I mean, I'm not blaming anybody. This is just a human nature. So there is there is clear clearly that everybody um, is affected with any complication and morbidity. And so, in a way, if we conclude things, um, mortality is easy metric. It depends on morbidity. Morbidity, there's a better classification system. We're working on things. Things will get better, hopefully, with time. QI projects, um, we share the successes and the learning opportunities that we uh, that we hoped. And uh, ultimately, um, the future is, uh, is patients-related outcomes. So, I cannot uh, finish the talk and... Uh, by saying that I did all this by myself, I'm not at all. I have many thanks to spread from the leadership of the hospital, but more importantly, Dr. Weiss, Hartenbach, Krishna Rose, uh, Lisa, uh, Ryan, uh, Summer, and uh, Janelle. Those are my uh, colleagues who uh, helped me out, but also the, the QI teams from multidisciplinary uh, system, and of course, the UW leadership, Dr. Potoff, and all the QI chairs and the quality chairs. and. Uh, by this, I conclude and uh, I'm ready for questions and um, that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Feel free to unmute and go ahead and ask. We have about five minutes. Hello. Hello. Hi, this is. Gloria. Hi, Dr. Sardo. How are you? That's a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. I was just wondering if there was any way to assess the social determinants of health that exist and if that's been done in some of what you're doing. Right. There are a couple of studies that looked into uh, the social impact um, of complications and morbidities. Uh, I can't quote the numbers for real, but I, I know uh, there is a p-value and there uh, there is a significant impact on the social um, social impact on complication. As a matter of fact, part of my talk that I didn't end up doing here is actually talking about the impact of complications on society and the surgeons and whether we actually, knowing the complication and addressing it, actually changes our behavior. There are very good lessons that are have been published few on medical impact on society, but actually more uh, from the Amazon and uh, the Uber uh, apps where they actually looked at change of behavior when complications or problems happen. And it's fascinating uh, uh, study. It, it boils down to uh, that the changes happens 
uh, but there is a critical number of complications and problems that when addressed, the behavior will change whether, and this is from, again, it's, a, it's from the economy, from Amazon and the Uber um, apps. Uh, they they looked into that, and there is certain number of of things that can happen in a in a certain time when it happens. Uh, ch behavior changes, um, but uh, in terms of society, there are again a couple of studies that looked into the impact of complications on society. Not a whole lot, though. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful idea to do. I, I don't know how to, you know, go from there on on this. I'm, I'm sure if we propose it and think about it, we can we can do it. Oh, that's great. I think. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, it's Ellen Tartenbach. I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, the truth about most health outcomes is that the majority is the social determinants of health. But, but I do think uh, 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 Ahmed's talk was was fascinating, and it and it shows um, kind of his dedication to sort of improving quality and to consistently looking at large databases and our own specific database to improve quality. And he's done a wonderful job with trainees over the years, um, helping them um, as 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 he mentors them through these these improvement projects. Um, so I just want to compliment him on that. And and it's it's a beast to really get down to the details and try and figure out, you know, how to how to analyze these data sets and how to really um, make an impact. So um, kudos to him for his his work and his mentorship and um, mm -hmm. and this focus. What he's focusing on is these really you know sort of high volume high risk surgeries. Um, he's our highest volume surgeon and he's um, he spent ten years working working hard on all of this. And I just want to acknowledge that and compliment him on that work. Thank you so much. That's so generous of you. Appreciate it. I have a question about whether you'd be willing to share your slides. Um, yes, I already sent it to Lisa, so oh, she, should, great. she should have them. Yep. I was particularly interested in the project where you looked at kind of the bundle compliance and um, the surgical site infection and kind of tracked that right. um, over time. That was yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, I think that the learning lesson from there is, you know, the team who was designated to prospectively collect the data, because those data cannot be retrospectively collected. Somebody actually in the room is, you know, checking the box. If I have changed my gloves, yes or no. If the nurse have done this, yes or no. If the temperature, if the blood pressure, if this and that. So that's a lot of active work. And we, what we have learned is that without a dedicated um, institution and hospital and a department uh, to allocate resources to find those people who will actually get involved in the data collection. Uh, nothing will happen, but yes, fascinating. And we actually learned a lot. The average adoption time of any new uh, metric is three months. And the, the, when we say average, it goes up above 75%. Uh, and then the perfection is around five, five months where we go above 90%. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating. The, the only confounding factor for compliance and adoption is uh, sharing and education. Basically, communication. So the more you talk, the more um, the more you address it, the more they they adopt it. Yeah. And I want to also uh, thank uh, Dr. Gloria Sardos and Hartenbach. Uh, you know, when I came in to Madison in two thousand and seven, you know, I, I picked up the phone to Hartenbach and I said, I want to come here, and uh, she said, Give me two days, and uh, she connected me with Dr. Sardos, who gave me uh, the fellowship and. Uh, for women's health and the masters and starting a masters in public health. So um, I just wanted to compliment and push back the full circle that uh, all this and, you know, my life could have not been better without your support. And of course, the support of Dr. Rice and all my colleagues, Krishna Rose and all my all of them without any exceptions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This was a great presentation. I think we're just out of time here, but um... Thank you uh, everyone for joining and um, thank you, Dr. Amiyami for presenting. Thanks so much. Great, great. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah, you too, bye-bye.